Hello, and welcome back to Scrum Study. We hope you enjoyed the previous video drawing comparisons between Scrum and the other traditional project management methods. Today, we'll look at a different approach to Scrum. First, let's take a look at this company. ABC is a software manufacturer who's decided to run all their projects in Scrum. They want to increase the quality of products and shorten the time to market. So in the ground level, the Scrum team is ready to implement the methodology. And in the first sprint itself, they've achieved excellent feedback from all quarters. The team members are happy, and the company wants to introduce Scrum in all projects across different verticals. Everything seems perfect, but is that the real scenario? The answer is no. The introduction of a new methodology always has pros and cons at the beginning. Scrum isn't different either. When Scrum is first introduced, it can evoke a lot of employee concerns. For instance, some of the roles may look redundant, and they may feel threatened or fearful of losing individual identity in an open work environment. So how can Scrum be sustained in an organization? Well, this is where the human resources department of a company plays a pivotal role in addressing such issues. They can develop a model to sustain Scrum in the organization. Let's talk about the popular HR theories and their relevance to Scrum today. We'll start with Tuckman's model of group dynamics. The Scrum approach and method may initially seem quite different and difficult for a new Scrum team. A new Scrum team, like any other new team, generally evolves through a four-stage process during its first Scrum project. This process is known as Tuckman's model of group dynamics. The main idea behind the model is that four stages, such as forming, storming, norming, and performing, are imperative for a team to develop by mitigating problems and challenges, finding solutions, planning work, and delivering results. The four stages in the model are first, forming which is often experienced as a fun stage because everything is new and the team hasn't yet encountered any difficulties with the project. Storming is the next stage. During this stage, the team tries to accomplish the work. However, power struggles may occur, and there is often chaos or confusion among team members. Norming follows storming. This is when the team begins to mature, sort out their internal differences, and find solutions to work together. It's considered a period of adjustment. During performing, the team becomes its most cohesive, and it operates at its highest level in terms of performance. The members have evolved into an efficient team of peer professionals who are consistently productive. More on this. Here we have a diagram depicting the four different stages in Tuckman's stages of group development. Moving on, let's learn how helpful another HR model is. Conflict management helps resolve conflicts that arise during a Scrum project. Organizations applying the Scrum framework encourage an open environment and dialogue among employees. Conflicts among Scrum team members are generally resolved independently, with little or no involvement from management or others outside the Scrum team. Conflict management techniques are used by team members to manage any conflicts that arise during a Scrum project. Sources of conflict evolve primarily due to schedules, priorities, resources, reporting hierarchy, technical issues, procedures, personality, and costs. There are a few conflict management techniques in practice. Usually, there are four approaches to managing conflict in an organization applying Scrum processes. There are namely win-win, lose-win, lose-lose, and win-lose. Let's take a look at them one by one. In a win-win situation, it's usually best for team members to face problems directly with a cooperative attitude and an open dialogue to work through any disagreements to reach consensus. Organizations implementing Scrum should promote an environment where employees feel comfortable to openly discuss and confront problems or issues and work through them to reach win-win outcomes. Now let's define a lose-win situation. Some team members may at times feel that their contributions aren't being recognized or valued by others. 
or that they aren't being treated equally. This may lead them to withdraw from contributing effectively to the project and agree to whatever they're being told to do, even if they are in disagreement. This approach is called lose-win. This situation may happen if there are members in the team, including managers, who use an authoritative or direct style of issuing orders and or don't treat all members equally. This approach isn't a desired conflict management technique for Scrum projects. Since active contribution of every member of the team is necessary for the successful completion of each sprint, the Scrum Master should encourage the involvement of any team members who appear to be withdrawing from conflict situations. For example, it's important for all team members to speak and contribute to each daily stand-up meeting so that any issues or impediments can be made known and managed effectively. Another approach used in resolving conflict is lose-lose. In conflict situations, team members may attempt to bargain or search for solutions that bring only a partial degree or temporary measure of satisfaction to the parties in a dispute. This situation could happen in scrum teams where team members try to negotiate for suboptimal solutions to a problem. This approach typically involves some give and take to satisfy every team member instead of trying to solve the actual problem. This generally results in an overall lose-lose outcome for the individuals involved and, consequently, the project. The scrum team should be careful to ensure that team members don't get into a lose-lose mentality. Scrum daily stand-up and other scrum meetings are conducted to ensure that actual problems get solved through mutual discussion. Win-lose is the next approach. At times, a scrum master or another influential team member may believe he or she is a de facto leader or manager and try to exert their viewpoint at the expense of the viewpoints of others. This conflict management technique is often characterized by competitiveness and typically results in a win-lose outcome. This approach isn't recommended when working on scrum projects because scrum teams are by nature self-organized and empowered, with no one person having true authority over another team member. Although the scrum team may include persons with different levels of experience and expertise, every member is treated equally and no person has the authority to be the primary decision maker. Now, let's move on to learn about the different leadership styles used across organizations. First of all, what is a leader? A leader is someone who has the ability to get others to follow him or her willingly. Here, in this context, we need to think about which leadership style works best for the organization. Leadership styles vary depending on the organization, the situation, and even the specific individuals and objectives of the Scrum project. So let's look at some common leadership styles. Servant leadership is the first one we'll discuss. Servant leaders employ listening, empathy, commitment, and insight while sharing power and authority with team members. Servant leaders are stewards who achieve results by focusing on the needs of the team. This style is the embodiment of the scrum master role. Delegating is another leadership style. In this, delegating leaders are involved in the majority of decision making. However, they delegate some planning and decision making responsibilities to team members particularly if they are competent in handling the assigned tasks. This leadership style is appropriate in situations where the leader is in tune with specific project details and when time is limited. There is also an autocratic leadership style. Autocratic leaders make decisions on their own, allowing team members little, if any, involvement or discussion before a decision is made. This leadership style should only be used on rare occasions. Directing leaders instruct team members about which tasks are required, when they should be performed, and how they should be performed. With a leadership style like laissez-faire, the team is left largely unsupervised, so the leader doesn't interfere with their daily work activities. Often this style leads to a state of anarchy. By having a style like coaching and supportive leadership, 
Leaders issue instructions and then support and monitor team members through listening, assisting, encouraging, and presenting a positive outlook during times of uncertainty. Next is the task-oriented style, in which task-oriented leaders enforce task completion and adherence to deadlines. And last, the assertive leadership style is one in which assertive leaders confront issues and display confidence in establishing authority with respect. Now let's take a closer look at them one by one. The first leadership pattern is discussed in the servant leadership. The preferred leadership style of scrum projects is servant leadership. This term was first described by Robert K. Greenleaf in an essay entitled The Servant as Leader. According to Greenleaf, the servant leader is servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve and to serve first. Then a conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. That person is sharply different from one who is leader first perhaps because of the need to assuage an unusual power drive or to acquire material possessions, says Greenleaf. The leader first and the servant first are two extreme types. Between them, there are shadings and blends that are part of the infinite variety of human nature. Greenleaf adds that the difference manifests itself in the care taken by the servant first to make sure that other people's highest priority needs are being served. The best test, and the most difficult to administer, is to ask these questions. Do those served grow as individuals? Do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, and more likely themselves to become servants? And what is the effect on the least privileged in society? Will they benefit, or at least not be further deprived? Elaborating on the writings of Greenleaf, Larry Spears identifies ten traits that every effective servant leader should possess. And here are those traits. Listening. The servant leaders are expected to listen intently and receptively to what is being said or not said. They're able to get in touch with their inner voice and to understand and reflect on their own feelings. Empathy follows as a second attribute. Good servant leaders accept and recognize individuals for their special and unique skills and abilities. They assume workers have good intentions and accept them as individuals, even when there are behavioral and performance issues. Healing is a third characteristic aspired. The motivation and potential to heal oneself and one's relationship with others is a strong trait of servant leaders. Servant leaders recognize and take the opportunity to help their colleagues who are experiencing emotional pain. Awareness is another quality admired. Awareness, and particularly self-awareness, is a trait of servant leaders. This allows them to better understand and integrate issues such as those related to ethics, power, and values. Persuasion follows as another trait. Servant leaders use persuasion rather than their positional authority to gain group consensus and make decisions. Rather than forcing compliance and coercion, as is typical in some authoritarian management styles, servant leaders practice persuasion. Next is conceptualization, which is the ability to view and analyze problems in an organization from a broader conceptual and visionary perspective, rather than focusing on merely the immediate short-term goals. This is a unique skill of good servant leaders. Another virtue is foresight. Their intuitive minds allow servant leaders to use and apply past lessons and present realities to foresee the outcome of current situations and decisions. Stewardship is another desirable feature for leaders. Stewardship demands a commitment to serving others. Servant leaders prefer persuasion over control to ensure that they gain the trust of others in the organization. 
Commitment to the growth of others is a feature that demands that servant leaders have a deep commitment to the growth of people within their organization. They take on the responsibility of nurturing the personal, professional, and spiritual growth of others. For example, providing access to resources for personal and professional development, encouraging workers to participate in decision making. And last, building community is another feature in which servant leaders are interested in building communities within a working environment particularly given the shift in societies away from smaller communities to large institutions shaping and controlling human lives. Scrum supports the idea that all leaders of Scrum projects, including the Scrum Master and product owner, should be servant leaders who have the above traits. The next HR theory we are going to learn is Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs theory. Maslow, in 1943, presented a needs hierarchy, recognizing that different people are at different levels in their needs. Usually, people start out looking for psychological needs and then progressively move up the needs hierarchy. You can see this hierarchy depicted here. To be successful, a scrum team needs both core and non-core team members who have reached the esteem or self-actualization levels. The concept of self-organizing teams, which is a key principle in Scrum, requires team members to be self-motivated and to participate and contribute fully towards meeting the project goals. As a leader, the Scrum Master needs to understand where each person on the team is relative to the pyramid. This understanding will help to determine the best approach to motivating each individual. Additionally, everyone fluctuates up and down the levels in the needs hierarchy throughout life due to their own motivation and efforts to move up the hierarchy or sometimes due to factors beyond their control that may push them down. The Scrum Master's goal is to work with individuals on the team to build their skills and knowledge and help them move up the needs hierarchy. This support results in a team that consists of individuals who are motivated and strong contributors to the project and to the organization as a whole. Another popular HR theory relevant to Scrum we're going to discuss in this segment is the Theory X and Theory Y. It was proposed by Douglas McGregor in 1960. First, according to Theory X, leaders assume that employees are inherently unmotivated and will avoid work if possible, warranting an authoritarian style of management. According to Theory Y, on the other hand, Leaders assume that employees are self-motivated and seek to accept greater responsibility. Theory Y involves a more participative management style. Scrum projects aren't likely to be successful with organizations that have Theory X leaders in the roles of Scrum Master or Product Owner. All leaders in Scrum projects should subscribe to Theory Y, whereby they view individuals as important assets and work towards developing their team members' skills and empowering their team members while expressing appreciation for the work that the team has completed to accomplish the project objectives. So that's it. We've come to the end of this segment. Before winding up, let me just say that the human resources in an organization can be instrumental in helping the enterprise embrace Scrum methodology. With that, we conclude the chapter on organization. I look forward to seeing you in the next video, Business Justification. Until then, keep learning Scrum. Thanks for watching.